The Legal Fuel Speaker Series, Better Lawyer, Better You. Legal Fuel is the practice resource center of the Florida Bar and a benefit to Florida Bar members. This ongoing speaker series will feature seasoned leaders from Florida's legal community who represent a wide spectrum of legal expertise and practice. With a focus on the fundamentals of today's legal practice, topics include finance, technology, human resources, marketing, client development, and day-to-day -day operations of your law firm. The Legal Fuel Speaker Series is brought to you by Florida Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. Florida Lawyers Mutual, defending the reputations of Florida attorneys since 1989. Go to flmic.com to learn more about the company created by lawyers for lawyers. We are now proud to present you the following. Hi, my name is Al Cycli. I'm a partner in the Miami office of Shook, Hardy & Bacon where I chair the firm's privacy and data security practice. In my practice, I advise clients on compliance with privacy laws, which are laws that govern the collection, use, storage, transmission, and disposal of sensitive information. Some examples of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis would be including, it would include advising companies on what to do after they've suffered a data breach, who they need to notify, what the notification letters need to say, representing them in class action lawsuits that arise from data breaches, and then in the more proactive side, we regularly advise companies regarding what they're allowed to do under these various privacy laws, state, federal, and international. We draft privacy policies and notices, review contracts for our clients that include provisions relating to privacy and data security. Here's an agenda for today's presentation. We're going to start by talking about what is the state of cybersecurity for small law firms. Take a second and think about what sort of information your firm collects. Think about what's in the files for your clients. What sort of personal information do you collect about your clients? Social security numbers, driver's license numbers, financial account information, biometric information possibly. Any sort of sensitive information about clients might be governed by Florida privacy laws or ethical rules. We're going to talk about what are law firms currently doing to protect that sort of information. Next, we're going to talk about why you should care about this. Not just what are the legal requirements. Sure, there is the Florida Information Privacy Act. There are ethical obligations that apply to what you are allowed to do with respect to the collection and use of sensitive client information. But there are business reasons why you want to make sure you're taking care of that sort of information as well. And then finally, we want to talk about what it is that you can do as a law firm to protect this information. What sort of administrative, technical, and physical safeguards should you be adopting to make sure that you're doing the most that you can with the resources that you have to protect sensitive client information? All right, so let's begin by talking about what's the current cybersecurity landscape for law firms. What is it that law firms are doing right, and what is it that they could be doing better to protect information about their clients? There have been recent surveys that have asked law firms questions about the security safeguards that they've adopted to protect client information, and we'll dive into one of those surveys right now. The Logic Force survey, which was recently released in October of 2017, was a survey of 300 U.S. law firms, and they asked questions about security safeguards that law firms were adopting in order to protect their clients' sensitive information. Here's some of the bad news from that survey. 62% of firms said that they did not have a designated information security professional. Think about that for a moment. That means that most law firms don't have someone who, are, who is specifically and solely responsible for making sure that there are security safeguards to protect client information. The survey also found that only 31% of law firms have formal cybersecurity training programs. One of the best ways to prevent a cybersecurity attack uh, or any sort of data breach is to make sure that you have training of your employees so that they know what are the risks and ways to mitigate those risks. Also, the survey showed that only 41% of firms have formally documented cybersecurity policies, incident response plans, and backup procedures. This is, of course, huge because 
law firms nowadays need to make sure that when they think that they've suffered a data breach, there's a blueprint that they can turn to that governs what they need to do in response to the incident. And that there are policies that are in place that they can show to clients when the client calls them and says, what are you doing to protect my information? They also need to make sure that they've got backup systems in place so that if something happens to sensitive data, they have a way to find it again and restore the way that they're doing business. Now let's talk about some of the good news in the survey. The survey found that there was a 41% increase in corporate data security audits on law firms by clients in the previous six months. That may not sound like a great thing, but it means that companies are more aware about what their outside counsel are doing with respect to the protection of their sensitive information. They're asking questions about it. They're getting on site to take a look at what law firms are doing. And if you want to compete for business these days for the, from, for the more sophisticated work, you definitely want to make sure that you're adopting certain security safeguards to protect sensitive information. The survey also showed that there is a 78% increase in new cybersecurity insurance policies at different law firms. That means that law firms are taking the issue much more seriously. It means that they're purchasing cybersecurity insurance policies, so when they have a data breach or a suspected data breach, they have an insurance company they can call to help them work through the process, to help them find outside counsel to advise them on their legal obligations, to help them find a forensic firm to investigate what they need to do, what happened as a result of the breach, and what sort of security safeguards they need to change or improve in order to prevent a breach in the future. So having a cybersecurity insurance policy is a really good thing. And the fact that there was this increase is great for both law firms and their clients. Third, the survey found there was a 28% increase in law firms with documented cybersecurity policies. What does this mean? This means that law firms are taking the issue more seriously. They're thinking about cybersecurity. They're developing formal policies. There means inevitably that they're training their employees on these policies. And so that also means that in the future, we're going to see more and more firms having more of these policies to protect sensitive information. Lawyers are under attack. And this slide talks about some of the ways in which law firms are under attack. One example is cyber espionage. What's cyber espionage? Cyber espionage means that there are malicious actors who are purposefully attacking law firms for the purpose of trying to obtain sensitive information about the law firm's clients. There has become an adage in the cybersecurity industry that law firms are the weak link. So of course, that's who attackers are focusing their efforts on because they know that clients share sensitive information with their firms. And it's not just personal information. It may be confidential proprietary information, trade secrets. And so now attackers are focusing their efforts on law firms. One example of this was in March of 2016, where we saw a report from the Wall Street Journal that documented attacks on some of the largest law firms in the United States and the world. There, the law, the, the law firms were the uh, victim of cyber attacks from third parties looking to steal proprietary information and then engage in trading, insider trading based on that information or to simply steal information about how products and services are being made, sold, price points, things like that. So cyber espionage is one reason why law firms are under attack. A second reason why law firms are under attack is ransomware. We've seen ransomware attacks all over the place. It hasn't just affected law firms, it also affects the healthcare industry significantly, financial services. What is a ransomware attack? A ransomware attack is where essentially you turn on your computer in the morning and you see it is completely locked up. Typically there's a screen there that shows you that your information has been encrypted and if you would like to decrypt the information you have to pay some certain amount of money, the ransom. And the ransom may be as small as three or four hundred dollars, it may be tens of thousands of dollars or even more depending on the family of ransomware that was used for the attack. You're then faced with the question of what do you do? You have sensitive client information that has been compromised perhaps as a result of the ransomware attack. Do you notify the client? Do you have the sufficient backup systems in place to make sure that you can get the information up and restored and that you can get your business going again? Ransomware is a very serious problem, but there are ways to minimize the risks of ransomware, which we'll talk about later, and to find out whether you're prepared to address ransomware as a threat to your organization. 
Third is spear phishing. Spear phishing means that you have been targeted with a specific email that seeks to get perhaps your login credentials or other information from you. A hacker pretends to be somebody that they're not. They send you an email in the hopes that you'll respond or click on a link that's been provided. An example may be somebody pretending to be from a company, pretending to be another lawyer, and they tell you there's a document that's attached they need, that you need to open. It's in your best interest. You click on the document thinking you're going to see something, but in fact, you've now just downloaded malware into your system. Spear phishing is a serious, serious threat, not just to law firms, but to all organizations. It's how some of the largest cyber attacks and data breaches have occurred. Fourth are insider threats. We often think about data breaches and cyber attacks as involving efforts made from outside parties to invade law firms or organizations. That's not always the case. Sometimes your biggest threat works in your very office. We've worked on matters that have involved law firms, for example, that had employees who had access to databases containing sensitive information for thousands and millions of individuals. That individual, in one instance, engaged in identity theft by accessing the information, stealing it, and selling it as part of an identity theft crime ring, all unbeknownst to the law firm until one day the FBI came knocking at their door. So it's important that you're vetting who works for you and what they do, and that you're limiting access to sensitive information. The point here is that you shouldn't always think of a cybersecurity threat as being an external actor. Sometimes it's someone who's working in the office right next to you. Lastly, another way in which lawyers are under attack is just simple negligence. Negligence can cause huge, huge data breaches and potential liability for companies, including law firms. Some examples of negligence would include for a, a lost laptop. You know, think about the fact that you know, we carry our laptops and we carry sensitive information around with us wherever we go on our mobile devices. If you leave that laptop in a conference room, if you leave it in a, and it's unattended and perhaps stolen, or you leave it in a car, in an Uber, you leave it in on a bus, and forget about it and it's lost, that is potentially a data breach depending on what the law says in any given situation. That requires sending out notice and imagine what that notice is going to look like when you send it to the client. So negligence is a real threat to law firms. You know, thumb drives also contain a significant amount of sensitive information on them. One spreadsheet alone could contain personal information for thousands and thousands of individuals you lose that sensitive information in that spreadsheet, you send an email to the wrong person that has a spreadsheet in it that they shouldn't have received, that is now potentially a data breach under the Florida Information Protection Act. So you've got to understand how do you minimize these risks, these negligence, these acts of negligence that could take place. And we'll try to talk a little bit about that as part of this presentation, but undoubtedly you really need to have an information security and assessment by an outside professional that specializes in information security and can tell you here are where your big risks are so that you can minimize those risks moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about what the bad guys want. Why is it that they're attacking law firms? What sort of information are they trying to get? First, trade secrets. They want to know how your clients make things. They want to know what sort of services they're offering and what they're thinking about offering. They steal that information so they can use it typically overseas and they get, it, they get it through cyber espionage. They want to know about M&A or IPO details. With that sort of information, they can engage in insider trading, and we've seen federal indictments against hackers overseas who have sought to engage in that sort of activity. They take information about companies and they engage in insider trading on it. And that's not necessarily always done by hackers overseas. In one instance, there was a lawyer who worked for a firm who used the document management system to look at the names of different files that were being prepared in a matter and then just from using the names of those files was able to engage in insider trading because he knew what, the, what those companies were going to be doing next. And of course he got in trouble for that. They want to know litigation strategy. What is the company thinking about their potential risks in litigation, the likelihood of success? the methods in which they want to defeat the opponent's motion to dismiss or dismiss a complaint. They want to know about intellectual property so that, again, like with trade secrets, they can replicate that, usually overseas. 
And then, of course, they want personal and financial information. It's no secret by now that personal and financial information has a monetary value on the black market. These bad guys go into what's called the dark web, and they sell things like credit card numbers, social security numbers, and other sensitive information that allows them to engage in identity theft and to purchase uh, products using your name, using your credit card number, and all of that sort of stuff, including healthcare information, actually has value on the, the dark web. So these are all just some of the examples of things that hackers want and why they're attacking law firms. Now let's talk a little bit about why you should care about all of this. Why does it matter? Why is it so important? Why should you care about privacy and cybersecurity? Well, for one reason, Florida law requires it. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about this, but essentially you need to know about the Florida Information Protection Act. If somebody were to say to me, Al, I'm a new lawyer. I know that, you know, I've just started my own practice. I know that there are laws that govern cybersecurity. Is there one law you can point me to to give me a general sense of what I should be doing next? I would point them to the Florida Information Protection Act, and we're going to talk about that next. But in addition to legal requirements, and keep in mind, there may also be, in addition to the Florida Information Protection Act, federal laws that govern what you do. One example of that is HIPAA, which has a privacy rule and security rule. And even if you're not a covered entity under HIPAA, meaning you're not a healthcare provider or a clearinghouse or somebody else who may be covered under HIPAA, you may be a business associate, which means you do work for a healthcare provider, for example, in which case HIPAA may apply to you. And that means you've got requirements under HIPAA that you need to be uh, aware of. You also have ethical rules. We're going to talk about those in more depth as well. What are you required to do according to the Florida Bar to make sure that you're protecting sensitive client information? Third, there are business reasons to make sure that you are protecting client information and you're aware of the privacy and cybersecurity norms and best practices in the legal industry. Clients expect it. It's becoming more and more frequent these days. If you want to compete for any kind of sophisticated business, you need to make sure that you have adopted reasonable technical, administrative, and physical safeguards. Remember that acronym, TAP. If you're thinking about what are the safeguards I need to be ad adopting, TAP is the technical safeguards, administrative safeguards, and physical safeguards. Those are things you need to be adopting in order to be able to, to compete for some of the work of your clients. Another reason why that privacy and security should matter to you is that you might face regulatory penalties as a result of it. When you suffer a data breach, and the question is always when, not if, you may be obligated to notify the Florida AG's office, the Florida Attorney General. When the Florida AG receives notice, they may have some questions for you. What were your policies in preparation for this incident? Did you have a plan on how to respond to it? What specific safeguards had you adopted to prevent this incident from happening? Were the emails, for example, if it involved emails, encrypted? Why weren't you using encryption? These are all some of the questions you might ask, and if the AG's office isn't satisfied, you might get hit with a fine or penalty under the Florida Information Protection Act. Under HIPAA, the Office for, for Civil Rights might bring their own enforcement action if you are in violation of the security rule or the privacy rule under HIPAA. You may also face regulatory penalties from the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, depending on the size of the breach and the nature of the activity that was involved. Fifth, you might also face a private class action lawsuit. Now, instinctively, you would probably think, what is the likelihood that a law firm is going to hit, get hit with a class action lawsuit relating to privacy and data security? I can give you an example of that right now. There's a lawsuit in Illinois called uh, Johnson, but with, involved a law firm called Johnson & Bell, and there was an allegation made by a former client that there were vulnerabilities in the website that could have allowed, and didn't actually allow, but could have allowed a hacker to obtain access to sensitive client information. And as a result of that, the law firm put at risk sensitive client information, and th the, the, the plaintiff there sought uh, damages. That lawsuit ultimately went to arbitration and was later resolved. However, it's still a perfect example of how the 
how information security, data security, and privacy can be so important and can lead potentially to class action lawsuits if you have a uh, client that's not happy with your services and is looking for some reason to bring a lawsuit against your firm. Let's talk now about some of the legal and ethical obligations that I referred to. We'll start with the Florida Information Protection Act. That's section 501.171 of the Florida statutes. That is essentially Florida's data breach notification law. Let's walk through some of the key concepts of that law, but regardless, I highly recommend that after you listen to and watch this presentation, you take a look at the statute, read it from start to finish, because it really does do a nice job of reminding lawyers what cybersecurity means, what a data breach means, and why it's so important that you're protecting client information. Because if a breach occurs, the consequences could be significant, not just in a monetary way, but also in terms of public relations. I mean, you as a law firm, as a lawyer, your job is the security and confidentiality of your client's information. And if there's a public data breach, there's very little that's more embarrassing for you in your career than knowing that that information is out there in the general public. So what is a data breach under this law? Now, typically when we use the term data breach, people think of cyber attacks. You think of some bad guy somewhere trying to get into your system and then stealing information. That is not necessarily a data breach. Sure, that's one kind of a breach, but there are other kinds of breach, breaches. The definition of a breach of security under the Florida Information Protection Act is the unauthorized access of personal information. So let's think about that for a second. Unauthorized access of personal information, it doesn't necessarily mean that the access is intentional. It doesn't mean, it could also, for example, mean the simple loss of a laptop that contains personal information on it. It could mean that you leave a file for a client sitting somewhere and you know, then somebody else potentially accesses it. All of these could potentially be a data breach under the law. What's personal information? So personal information under the Florida Information Protection Act means a person's name plus either a social security number, a driver's license number, financial account information, health information. Those are some examples and I would again advise you to take a look at the law and see what does the, personal inf what does the definition of personal information me mean under uh, the Florida Information Protection Act. Florida actually has a broader definition of personal information than most states because it includes usernames and passwords as personal information. Those are obviously things that we all use on a daily basis. So take another look at the statute, understand what is personal information, and then think about in what ways does your company, does your, bit, your law firm collect personal information. The other thing that the Florida Information Protection Act does is that it sets up notification obligations. So let's say you've had a breach of security that infected personal information. You may have an obligation to notify the Florida Attorney General's office if it's affected 500 or more individuals. You, you certainly have a uh, obligation to notify the individuals who've been affected as a result of the incident, and you have to do that within 30 days. Same thing with respect to the Florida AG's office. You also have an obligation to notify credit reporting agencies about the incident as well. We've just been talking about uh, the Florida Information Protection Act, and you shouldn't assume that that's the only law that applies to you. The thing about breach notification laws and data security in general is that the law that applies in any given situation is not the law of the, of the, of the state where the organization resides. It's the law of the state where the individual resides the individual who's been affected, often called a data subject. So you may potentially have a breach on your hands through the loss of one spreadsheet that affects individuals all over the United States if you've been collecting information from individuals everywhere. So you need to think about what law applies early on when you think that you've had a data breach because the definition of a breach itself differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. All, every single state has its own breach notification law. And they differ not just on the definition of a breach, but how quickly you have to notify. Some say you have to notify within a few days. 
Others say you have a month, maybe even two months under HIPAA, for example, uh, you know, with a federal law. So, you you know, this is it's something that is very complicated and you have to make sure that you are engaging appropriate outside counsel to help you advise you on what you have to do when you think you've suffered a data breach. Hopefully, counsel will point out to you the fact that there are also some exceptions under these breach notification laws. A couple of examples of such exceptions under the Florida Information Protection Act include encryption. If you encrypt data and the hacker gets into your system and, takes in, and gets access to the encrypted data, that is not considered a data breach because encrypted data is considered to be securely stored in a way that essentially mixes up the different characters of the message so that somebody who accesses it can't see the information. So make sure that you're using encryption as much as you can. There is an exception to the exception. For example, if the hacker gets into the system and gets the key that allows him to decrypt the encrypted data, but that rarely is the case. And so making sure that you're aware of that exception is one important thing. And what's the practical takeaway from that? It means that you need to look into encryption for your organization. Another exception under the Florida Information Protection Act is that if there's an incident that occurs, but there's no risk of material harm to the data subjects who've been affected as a result of the incident. An example may be you leave a laptop on a bus a, you know, the driver looks at the laptop, looks inside, figures out who it belongs to, calls you and says, you've left your laptop here on the bus. Maybe in that instance, a third party has accessed the information, but you know, you know where the laptop was at all given points in time. And so the risk of harm to the individuals whose information may have been on that laptop is low. And that's an, an analysis that needs to take place with counsel. You may still need to notify the AG's office of the fact that you're, you've made this determination, but it may prevent having to notify hundreds or thousands of individuals about a data breach. So those are some of the things with respect to the Florida Information Protection Act's breach notification requirements. But something else that's really important about the Florida Information Protection Act is that it creates affirmative requirements for data security, regardless of whether you have a data breach or not. Florida law says that if you have information about Florida residents, then you have a legal obligation to adopt reasonable measures to protect and secure that data. Unfortunately, there really isn't any guidance as to what that means, at least none that's been issued by the Florida AG's office. But you do need to start thinking about, again, that acronym, TAP, Technical, Administrative, and Physical Safeguards. We're going to go into some examples of that at the end of this presentation. But think of the technical safeguards being things like encryption, firewalls, the stuff that your information security team would typically work on on a day-to-day -day basis. Administrative safeguards might be training, policies, and then your physical safeguards would be ensuring that the data is stored in a physically safe place. And, and so think about that with respect to these requirements for data security under the Florida Information Protection Act. Now let's talk a little bit about what are your ethical obligations with respect to protecting sensitive client information. What do the Florida Rules of Professional Conduct say about what you have to do when you're preparing for and responding to a data breach, for example? And also, what do you have to do when you're communicating with clients about different things in a, in a matter and perhaps sharing sensitive information in the course of those communications? First and foremost, you have a duty to be competent. Take a look at Rule 4-1.1. You know, it used to be the case when I started practicing that it was okay, maybe even kind of cool for a lawyer to say, you know what, I don't understand email, I let my secretary take care of it. Or you know what, I don't understand encryption, I don't know about those computers, I write by hand. That is no longer acceptable. The Florida Bar and the ABA now has made it very, have both made it very clear that you need to acquire competence with respect to any technology that your law firm adopts. That means learning it yourself or retaining a third party that can help you learn everything you need to know about the security, privacy, and technological parts of using new technology. So for example, you're thinking about email. You've got to understand how to use email, how to protect email, what is encryption. When you're surfing the web, 
do you, does your um, browser, for example, have appropriate encryption protection built into that so that you know, if you visit a, a malicious site, there's an alert that goes off that tells you this is a malicious site. Would you know what to do with that? You know, are you able to identify a spear phishing email when it comes in? You got to know that sort of stuff, and it's not acceptable to say it's past my time. I don't specialize in that. I don't really know about that sort of stuff. I'm not a techie kind of person. That is not acceptable. So think about your duty of competence under the Florida Bar's Rule 4-1.1. Next. You have to think about your duty to protect client information. Florida Rule of Professional Conduct 4-1.6 was recently amended to add a provision that says that you have an obligation to adopt reasonable measures to protect against the inadvertent disclosure of sensitive client information. Again, that goes to that acronym, TAP, the technical safeguards, administrative safeguards, and physical safeguards that your office is using to make sure that client information is being protected. So, you know, we talked a little bit about the Florida Information Protection Act and the fact that that requires reasonable security safeguards. You now have an ethical obligation in addition to the statutory obligation to adopt safeguards to protect client information. There's also some, a, a, there are also a couple of really good ABA opinions on the topic of what does it mean to adopt reasonable security safeguards, and I would encourage you to look those up and get a better sense of that. Third, you have a duty to transmit sensitive information securely. What does that mean? Well, think about when you're emailing your client or emailing a third party, perhaps with medical records or financial information about the case. Are you transmitting that information in a secure way? If you are sending it in a PDF, for example, is the PDF secured? Is it encrypted? You know, something to think about sometimes is if you send an email saying, here's a PDF and I've password protected it. Oh, and by the way, the password is 1234. You might want to think about including that password in a separate email or not sending it an email altogether, but transmitting it through a different method of communication, whether by telephone or hard copy, uh, if it's particularly sensitive information. Take a look at the comment to Rule 4-1.6 to get a better sense of this, but one of the issues that the ABA is currently grappling with is whether it should require lawyers to encrypt all email communication regarding a case. And right now, as a result of an ABA opinion that came out last year, it looks like that's the case. That is something that lawyers should be doing, except with respect to, quote unquote, routine information, routine emails. But it's not very clear what that means. Next, you have a duty to update security. We've been talking about technical, administrative, and physical safeguards, but the reality is what's good today as a safeguard may not be good six months from now or a year from now, and you gotta be thinking about that. A certain level of encryption may be state-of-the-art today, but you know, another year or two from now, it might not be state-of-the-art. It might not even be very good. There may be better ways to, to secure sensitive information. You know, certainly, we know that technology is moving very quickly. The world of cybersecurity and information security is moving very quickly, and there's always new technology coming out. And I think, for example, of credit card numbers, where initially the thought was try to encrypt credit card numbers to protect them. And that had been the common way of thinking about protection of credit card numbers for quite a long time. Now, though, the, the move is not to collect the credit card number, credit card number to begin with and instead use something called tokenization, where you collect a token that represents the credit card number and can be used to engage in the financial transaction. To you, the, credit, the token doesn't look like anything to a hacker, the token doesn't look like anything that's useful, but in fact it can be used to engage in a financial transaction. So look into tokenization to the extent, extent that you're collecting credit cards for payment of your legal services, for example. And you shouldn't have full credit card numbers anywhere, anyway, and certainly not in, in paper form anywhere in your office. That is a rule of the payment card industry's uh, security protocols, uh, and so you want to make sure that you're not doing that to begin with, but tokenization might be an example of how there's been updates to security and you want to be thinking about what do those updates require for your organization. Next, there's a duty to outsource information securely. 
you, you as a law firm collect a certain amount of sensitive information, but chances are that you also share that information. Maybe you're preparing for trial and you share medical records with a company that's engaged in photocopies or creating trial exhibits. Maybe you share medical records or financial information with one of your expert witnesses. What's your expert witness doing with that information? Who is she or he sharing it with? Uh, how are they securing it? Those are all questions you need to be asking. Maybe you're thinking about starting to use the cloud to store information. There's an opinion that has been issued by the Florida Bar on what you need to be doing if you're thinking about moving to the cloud and has a nice checklist of some of the questions you should be asking. The Florida Bar has also put together some really good materials on the topic of moving to the cloud and things you should be looking at when thinking about moving your office to using the cloud. Quite frankly, I think using the cloud is a really good idea because where it used to be the case a while ago that maybe the cloud uh, was not necessarily the most securely way, secure way to store information, companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon have built in protection for that sort of information that can really help you. So think about you know, when you're, what you, who you're using when, as a vendor for your law firm and what sort of information do they have. And you know, give real thought to this because you would, there are potential vendors beyond the ones that you might ordinarily think of who may have access to your information. Think about the janitorial crew that comes to your office at night when you're not there. You know, what, what are you doing to vet who's working for that janitorial crew? What are you doing to limit their access to information? You would, might not think of them as a high risk type uh, um, way in which information could be compromised, but I've worked on a matter that involved a janitorial crew that was coming through in the middle of the night, taking information out of uh, storage bins that were used. You know, employees were told that they should have been uh, shredding information. And instead of shredding the information, they put them in these little bins next to their garbage cans, which was, of course, a gold mine to the bad guys. And the bad guys that were working for this janitorial crew came in and started taking the information out of those bins and selling it as part of an identity theft crime ring. So think about that. Next, think about your duty to communicate to the client. And what does that mean in the privacy and security context? Well, if there's been a data incident, you know, it may not necessarily arise to the level of a breach yet, but if it's a material incident and it somehow affects the way in which you're representing the client, there's an obligation to let the client know about that incident. Even if there's not an ethical or even legal obligation to do it, there may be a contractual one. Take a look at you know, what your contract with your client requires you to do with respect to security and with respect to communicating with the client about security. Take a look at Rule 4-1.4b as to what it means with respect to communicating with your client. So I've thrown a lot at you in this presentation so far. We've talked a lot about what are the legal obligations, what are your ethical obligations to protect client information. We've talked about some of the risks to client information, ways in which law firms are under attack, ways in which even unintentionally you may lose client information and cause a data breach for, for your firm, which triggers all sorts of potential penalties and uh, even civil lawsuits. And I can't stand here and tell you there's a magic bullet to prevent all of that. I would tell you that the number one thing that you can do is contact a really good information security firm to come in and perform an audit for you. But I will also tell you that in my 11 or 12 years of practice in this area, there are some things that I've seen that companies have done that have minimized the risks and typically when we see reports that are developed by information security experts in this area, there are some common areas where we see them address flaws of, the, of their, their clients who've asked for these audits and make some recommendations. So I'm going to share with you some of those ways now. You shouldn't give necessarily any priority to any of these uh, based on how they're ranked, but they are some examples that you should be thinking about what you're doing with respect to them with your firm. All right, so one of the first things you need to do is take an inventory. Figure out what sort of sensitive information are you collecting. Maybe it's, you know, you get a legal pad out and you write down what is sensitive information and you make a list and it's social security numbers and driver's license numbers and 
date of birth and medical information. You're putting all of that into a list. Then start thinking about, do I collect any of this and how do I collect it? And if I don't, is somebody collecting it for me? Is the receptionist collecting any of this? Is my administrative assistant collecting any of this? Is the paralegal collecting any of this? What do they do with it? Where do they put it? How do they store it? In what form is it? Is it in electronic form? Is it in paper form? If it's in paper form, am I keeping it in a cabinet? What am I doing with it? Am I locking that cabinet? You really need to take an inventory and be as broad as possible in trying to think of what potential sensitive information do you collect. Why is this important? It's important because, number one, until you know what information you're collecting, you don't really know what laws apply to you. Remember, we talked about how the applicable law is the location of the data subject, not the location of your office. So you may potentially be governed by laws outside the state of Florida, and they may have different requirements with respect to security than Florida does. Massachusetts, for example, California as well, both have very stringent requirements on what you're supposed to be doing when you collect data about residents of their states. So make sure you're collecting, you're, you're taking that inventory to figure out what information you have and, and what you're doing with it and who you're sharing it with. Once you've got a sense of what information you have, the next thing you'll be able to figure out, hopefully, is what are your legal and ethical obligations with respect to that data? We talked about the Florida Information Protection Act and some of Florida's ethical obligations, but there may be other laws, as I mentioned, in California, New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, for example, all have important and significant and different privacy laws, data security laws that apply to you. There may be federal laws that apply to you, whether it's Graham-Leach-Bliley, because unfortunately the federal, at the federal level here in the United States, we don't have a single privacy or data security law. Those laws are much more sector-based. HIPAA is an example of a privacy and data security law affecting the healthcare sector. Graham-Leach-Bliley affects the financial services sector. There are other laws governing the uh, public sector. And so you, we want to be thinking about what laws apply to you. I would advise you to consult an expert in privacy and data security law in that area. And there are several of those that are really good right here in the state of Florida. Next, and maybe this is the most important thing that's on my list of the top 10, you want to undertake an information security assessment to identify areas of potential improvement. You might instinctively think, well, you know, I'm a small firm, I can't afford that kind of thing, I don't want to hire an expert in this area, uh, they're going to charge me tens of thousands of dollars to do something like this, and I just, I can't afford that. But I would tell you a couple of things. Number one, it, they're not necessarily as expensive as you might think, if it, particularly if you find the right provider. And we've got a handful of excellent information security experts that we work with on a daily basis that, I, that are, 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 they tailor their services to smaller companies and are perfect for smaller law firms. Because the reality is, whatever I tell you today, you may be watching this six months later, you may be watching it a year or two later, and it may be out of date by then. And quite frankly, what I'm giving you now is fairly superficial in terms of recommendations. You need an in-depth review of what you're doing. And they can give you some specific advice for your organization, so I'd highly recommend it. There are some great vendors out there. You just need to do your research and ask around. Next, and we talked about this a little bit already, you want to make sure that you're encrypting your mobile devices. That means your smartphones, but it definitely also means your laptops. There's really no excuse these days for not encrypting your mobile device. Uh, encryption's really easy. If you have um, most laptops these days allow you to encrypt ver with, with some changes in the settings uh, very easily and at no additional cost. Now it means that you're going to have to put in a password every time that you access your mobile device, but given the potential cost of a data breach, uh, if you lose that laptop, uh, adding in a password is a fairly minor inconvenience uh, for using your devices. And quite frankly, having to explain to a client why you weren't encrypting your mobile devices can be very embarrassing. So make sure that you're encrypting your mobile devices. Remember again that the Florida Information Protection Act and all of the data breach notification laws that are out there do have an exception for encrypted data. 
So if there's encrypt, if the data that was the subject of the cyber attack was encrypted, there would not be an obligation to notify in those circumstances. Uh, so take a look at making sure that you're encrypting all of your mobile devices. Next, make sure you're adopting strong password policies. What's a strong password policy? You want to make sure that your password isn't easy to guess. You know, it's not something like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and, and importantly, that you're changing it and that it's a mix of, of, a, of characters, it's letters, it's numbers, it's, it's, you know, a hashtag on there, whatever it may be, but that it's difficult to guess and that you're changing it. You should be changing your password at least every three months. I work with information security experts on a daily basis and one of their top tips is make sure that you're using two-factor authentication to protect information. What is two-factor authentication or also called multi-factor authentication? It means authentication based on more than what you know, but maybe also who you are or what you have. Think of those three things. What you know, an example of that would be say a password, who you are, an example of that might be biometric information like putting your fingerprint or taking an iris scan, and what you have, maybe a, a key card or something that you would put up against a scanner that verifies that you are uh, who you say you are. Multi-factor authentication means doing at least two of those three things. So you could have a password, plus you might have a text message that's sent to you that you need to confirm that you are uh, who you say you are. If you use multi-factor authentication, you increase the level of security for your organization tenfold. I was at a conference recently and I heard er Eric Schmidt of Google recently speak and the question was posed to him, what is the number one thing you would do to recommend improving security? And he said, multi-factor authentication. It doesn't cost much money. It's fairly easy to do, but you know, and there, these days it's a very simple process. So it's definitely something you should look into. Next, prepare an incident response plan. If you have a cyber attack, you need to have some sort of a blueprint, a manual that tells you what you need to do. Incident response plans are uh, very, very useful. They're the number one document that I recommend to our clients to prepare right away uh, when they come to us and they say, we need to get ready for uh, complying with privacy and, and cybersecurity laws. It should do two things. Number one, it should provide a method of identifying what is a data breach or a data incident and, and providing a way in which that can be escalated to the appropriate people. And number two, it should give a list of who should be involved when an incident occurs, not just internally, but externally as well. Who are your vendors going to be? Who are you going to call for forensic services, for legal services, for mailing services, and for telephone center services? Who's your insurance carrier? Who in law enforcement do you need to contact? Which regulatory authorities do you need to contact? All of that information should be in one place and make sure that it's in written form in addition to electronic form because when all your data gets locked up, you might not be able to access it quickly. Make sure you're preparing an incident response plan. Next is employee training. You want to make sure that everybody in your office understands what is personal information, what are the risks to personal information, and what are the things that they should be doing to minimize those risks. It's not just your job as the lawyer in the office or, or, even, just the, or, or even the office manager to make sure that these risks are attended to and minimized. Everybody needs to be aware of what the privacy and security risks are what is sensitive information, why is it sensitive, and what should they be doing to minimize the chance of a data breach occurring. I suggest to our clients that they have at least annual training on the subject. That is certainly something that we do as a firm as well. Uh, and so it's something that you wanna be thinking about doing and you can make it fun. It doesn't have to be long. You can tell stories, you can watch videos, whatever it may be to make it entertaining, but still raising awareness of what are the cybersecurity risks out there. Some firms and companies, some of our clients actually uh, use something called uh, phishing testing as well, where they send emails to their employees to see if the employees will click on malicious links that are, or unknown links in, in the email to test how aware they are of what a spear phishing email may be. 
and then they can minimize some of those risks by talking to those employees afterwards, perhaps giving them additional training if necessary. Again, that's something that one of those information security firms that I mentioned earlier can help you address. Next, make sure you're backing up your data. This is a really important one. When there's a ransomware attack and your data is locked up, one of the easiest ways to get back into business right away without having to pay the ransom is ensuring that you have a secure backup of your data, which allows you to restore the information uh, back to where you were and continue working. Backing up your data is so vital. Uh, imagine if you, with all of your client documents, if you lost all of them tomorrow, what would you do? What, you wouldn't have your templates anymore. You wouldn't have the information for your client's files. And it would take you a very, very long time to try to get, retrieve all of that. So make sure you're backing up your data. There are ways to do this that are seamless to your business and that occur in the background. You don't even see it happening. You don't have to wait for it to occur. Again, talk to these information security experts about ways to do that. Next, make sure you're staying informed. I'd say this is probably my last and final tip. Uh, make sure that you're keeping apprised of what are the developments in cybersecurity and in privacy. What does the law require you to do? What are others in your industry doing? There are some fantastic information sharing organizations that you might want to join. If you have somebody responsible for information security in your organization, your IT guy, there are um, information sharing organizations specifically for law firms, and that can help you learn what are the threats to law firms right now. I mean, literally this minute, uh, what are things that law firms are doing? And you can meet peers at other firms that are dealing with these issues to help minimize some of those risks. But you gotta make sure you're staying informed because the threats are constantly changing. Hackers are finding new ways to attack law firms, and you wanna make sure that you know who those are so you don't become the law firm that becomes nationally known for suffering a data breach. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope you learned a little bit about privacy and data security as it affects the legal industry, particularly small law firms. Here's my contact information on the screen. If you have any questions, if you wanna chat about this some more, don't hesitate to pick up the phone, give me a call. Thanks so much, take care. Legal Fuel connects Florida bar members with strategic tools designed to help you fuel your law practice with increased efficiencies and profitability. Whether you want to launch a new firm, better market your services, or strengthen your internal operations, Legal Fuel provides attorneys with the resources you need to run your business smarter and more efficiently. Visit LegalFuel.com today to help manage your practice and fuel your business.